Welcome to Emerging Languages Camp 2010. News Speak by Gilead Brocka. All right, uh, that is going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about News Speak in 20 minutes or less. So, in now 17 minutes and 52 seconds, News Speak. So, we better get started. Uh, Broadly speaking, it's a dynamically typed class-based language. That's a category you're all familiar with. You can think of Python, or Ruby, or more, more pertinently, Smalltalk, which is uh, the direct ancestor of Newspeak. Uh, and what makes it different from all these languages are a couple of unusual properties. Uh, basically, the fact that all names are late-bound is a fairly unusual property in, in most languages. The fact that there's no global namespace whatsoever is also pretty unusual, and the combination is the intersection of those, so that's fairly uh, different, and it leads to, to some interesting properties. Uh, in particular, it uh, seems to give a fairly minimalist way to achieving a, a bunch of important goals. Modularity, uh, I don't know what you think, but except for the language formerly known as PLT scheme, I'm not aware of a language that has anything that I would recognize as a real modularity. Uh, they're now called bracket. Security, uh, you know, we're entering a world of cyber warfare. It, it pays to actually think about this a little ahead of time. A reflectivity you all know and love, the things that make languages actually dynamic, and of course reconciling this with security is sometimes a bit of a challenge. And we do want to play nice with the rest of the world. So, uh, the thing to the high level bit about Newspeak modularity is that it is based entirely on the concept of classes. There are no modules, units, packages, templates, features, what have you. Uh, basically, classes nest and do not think of Java nested classes. This is different. And uh, basically, you define a top level class as your, it implicitly defines a module, and you put libraries and stuff inside of that. We'll, we'll go into more detail. So let's talk about these two unusual properties. Uh, all names are late bound. Uh, another way of, this is something I've been calling message-based programming, again, in the small talk sense more than in the asynchronous sense, though asynchronous messages are part of the master plan too. Uh, basically, every runtime operation, every name <coughs> is a message then, or if you prefer, you can think of it in the absence of asynchronous calls, you can think of it as a virtual name. Uh, so, another way of putting this, this enforces programming to an interface. Programming to an interface, this is kind of a slogan everyone hears, but in most languages, you can't actually do that. Uh, you'll find that the language doesn't allow it in certain cases, and in other cases, it's just too painful to do. Uh, so, for example, we never refer to variables directly. It's not that we don't have variables, we call them slots, but the main point is you are always talking to, by means of a getter and a setter, and that doesn't mean you have to define properties or use a lousy syntax or anything, it just uh, falls out naturally. So your code never cares, including code in the class itself, never cares how you actually chose to represent. Uh, more interesting is what happens when about with classes, because again, you can't refer to them directly, because everything is really just a virtual method call. So you're basically always accessing your classes by means of, of access or methods of getters, which implies, for example, that classes have to be first class, because you're getting them back or something. Uh, it implies a whole bunch of other interesting properties that usually would have to be features that you sort of plan to put into your language. For example, classes being virtual. Right? Uh, hopefully, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this idea, but uh, if you nest classes, uh, the nested classes can be overridden just like methods can. And in fact, you can override a class with a method that keeps the class dynamically, or a slot that holds a method, and vice versa, and nobody cares because they're all going through a procedural interface. So virtual classes just fall out automatically from this idea of late binding. Uh, by the same token, we get mixins for free. Right? If you define a class, you define it. Say what its superclass is, since the superclass is in fact late bound, you cannot actually tie the body of the class to a particular superclass. It's always subject to override, and we made it a little more convenient to do that. And therefore, you can do uh, neat things like class hierarchy inheritance. So you will define an entire library nested or framework nested within a top level class, and you can subclass that, and if you want, say, to change some or add some attribute to Higher hierarchy, you override the, the root class of that hierarchy, just change that, and now you have a complete library that you in a new way. So all of this, the, the thing from a language design 
viewpoint, the thing that's nice about this is that none of this had to be designed in as a feature. It falls out of these, these four properties. Uh, let's talk about the absence of a global namespace. Uh, again, this, this is largely about modularity. And so, as I said, top-level class defines a module. It essentially does that because there's nothing for it to refer to. There is no surrounding scope. There is no surrounding namespace that it can refer to. So technically, it doesn't really have external dependencies, uh, which bothers some people because it isn't. We've been programming with these global namespaces for so long that we tend to forget uh, that there is really no such thing in the real world. But uh, the issue is, how does the thing actually do anything useful? How does it connect to to the world around it? And the answer to that is basically going to be that the class has a factory method. When you instantiate it, you pass parameters to that factory. That is the only connection to the outside world. And so uh, this, this makes for very self-contained modular definitions. And uh, because there's no, yeah? So there's, I mean, there's an upwards reductio problem with that, which is that quite literally at some point you have to connect to the outside world. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be very the short answer in 20 minutes is tooling, and I can show you exactly how that's done. Uh, yeah, this is exactly the point, right? You have to have some place to stand on, and that does bother me. Uh, okay, so uh, anyone who knows uh, anything about things like OSGI and the Java world knows how <coughs> incredibly heavyweight and complex it can be to achieve uh, the goal of having two copies of the same library configured differently running simultaneously, and, and what enormous amounts of machinery and effort have been put in to make that happen. Uh, but we have in object-oriented languages a mechanism that does just that, we instantiate objects. Because the entire library is, a, is defined in a class, you create two instances and <coughs> parameters and you're done. Uh, the other thing to remember is that uh, there's no static state, like there's no globals, and there isn't any state associated with the class definition per se, right? It is just code. So there are Essentially, the module definitions are truly immutable values. And all the state is in the instances. Therefore, if you create multiple copies of these things, they do not step on each other unless you go out of your way and somewhere out in the tool have fed them on the state. What else? Multiple implementations, right? Because we're talking through everything through an interface, the whole library is now encapsulated in one object. We can have multiple distinct implementations, completely different uh, Parser combinators, for example, you can have you know, a packrat implementation, and another kind of implementation, or whatever. You can have different algorithms, and as long as they preserve that external interface, they can coincide, and nobody cares that you write, you write code that's called morphic over both of them, etc. All of this, you know, just falls out from this model. So, a word about security. We are uh, somewhat concerned about this, and uh, the nice thing again that. Uh, this approach gives you sandboxing for free. Basically, because a top-level class sees no names outside itself, because it has no connection to the outside world, the only thing that it ever gets are the parameters to the factory. Those are they, those define your sandbox. They are capabilities in the sense of the object capability method that Mark can tell you all about, and I may tell you a little bit tomorrow, but probably won't. And uh, that's that's sort of the foundation of our security system. Not to say that we have a secure system, truth in advertising, we're running on squeak, you know, but the language is, is such that you actually have a hope of making a secure system without twisting it too much. Uh, reflectivity, right? So this is the security and reflectivity are kind of uh, intention. And so uh, what we do, we use an approach called mirrors that I think Tom might mention tomorrow or later this afternoon. <coughs> And basically the idea is rather than what you're used to from small dot, C logs, Java, whatever, where objects, they tell you their classes, the classes tell you their methods and their whatever other features they have and therefore you can respect on them and if you're lucky you can change them. Um, mirror, the idea of mirrors is to separate that <coughs> capability into a separate object. And so having an object doesn't mean that you can necessarily tamper with this class. Because of that, you can now pass those mirrors independently as capabilities which basically means that if you don't give anyone any such mirrors, then the thing is a lot of reflective as a portrait, dead to the world. And on the other hand, 
you can make it as flexible as you want. You can give it a mirror that will change the class of an object or whatever thing you, you wish to do. And in principle, you can control the granularity depending on the mirror API anywhere in between and give very fine grained control. Again, something to be demonstrated in fact as opposed to theory ongoing. Uh, interoperability. So again, all of this is just basic object-oriented programming. Uh, we don't have a feature in the language for external calls or natives or, or anything like that. Uh, if you, but you can interact with the world and you, what you need is an alien, a foreign object. And these objects will essentially encapsulate the ability to talk to, to some other systems. So C aliens, objective C aliens, Java aliens, JavaScript aliens, whatever, whatever alien world you wish to talk to. And uh, you can do callbacks by means of these enclosures. And you can have multiple foreign FFIs essentially to these different aliens. And again, it has the nice same property. If you don't want someone to call C, you don't give them an alien. Unlike, say, Java, where all the security guarantees of the platform are null and void if you call a native, because you don't know what that native will do, you can actually prevent any, you can know for sure that this thing is not going to be able to call a native, because there is no language feature to support that. So, we're running ahead of schedule, which is good. Uh, what's our status? Well, we have a, a fairly real system. We have uh, an IDE written in Newspeak. We have you know, GUI libraries, the whole, the whole graphical stack written in uh, basic libraries and stuff like that. Still somewhat in transition from its squeak basis, but, but by now most of it is in, in new speak. This is what it looks like. And uh, you can download it at newspeaklanguage.org. Uh, it's open sourced under Apache 2.0. What else shall I tell you? There's, there's a bunch of material. If any of this interests you, you can find any quite a few documents, tutorials, videos, audios, etc. blah, blah, blah site, uh, you are, you do so, you are an early adopter and, and at your own risk because you reserve the right and will to change all kinds of things and all kinds of things are still missing. But it's, uh, you know, at least on, on Windows you can do substantial stuff with it. Hopefully we'll have a, a version that compiles to the web in not too long. And, uh, shall we say, conclusion. Overall, the, the language design point here is that there's a whole list here things that really fit together very naturally, and I've talked about most of them, with the exception of concurrency, where actors are, again, a very natural fit here. A pluggable type systems actually fit in here very nicely. But all these things, because they all stem from this basic idea of using a very strict and austere form of object orientation, uh, they don't require a lot, a lot of mechanism. So it's really a very, very simple language. And uh, some credit for the people who helped me build this, and for the volunteers who are now, uh, since none of these people are paid to do this anymore. Um, hopefully I haven't forgotten anyone, so this gives you some scale. And some of these people have done a little bit, and some people, in particular Ryan, who started working on this when he was in high school and just finished his freshman year, uh, has done you know more work than anybody else. So these people have really helped in Are interfaces first class? Interfaces are not. There, there is no type. So this is dynamically typed. There is no uh, no notion of an interface. You can you could obviously build such a reflective representation, but there isn't any any such thing really. Are you considered using uh, prototypes? Yeah, I did consider using prototypes. Uh, I'll give you my. I'm, I'm somewhat known in, in to be a little bit opinionated. <laughs> so I'll give you my prototypes are great for the language designer. They give you a bit more simple, more basic calculus, and it's very attractive. Uh, I have not found it particularly attractive for the program, and uh, and there were also very mundane reasons like this had to be up and running in three months and, and so forth, which made it easier to take sweep at the point of departure. But moreover, I I, I am not a fan. Okay, so currently it runs on Squeak, and this was again the path of least resistance. They're 
frankly, there's no easier way to get, because of its basic, you know, in many, at, certainly at the expression level, it's pretty similar to small talk. There's, a small talk engine is actually a, a very good point of departure. And there were all these things about which licensing, there were, there were various reasons why we started it. Having said that, I would like to run on something else. Uh, so if, uh, you know, there's some people looking at like JVM implementations and with both dynamic, etc., that's beginning to seem more plausible, but it's still missing a lot from, from my perspective, but you know, maybe someone will do it. Uh, we're more interested in getting it to run. There, there is a, a compiler to JavaScript that's, well, a compiler module of bugs that we have to, not ready to release by any means, but uh, compiling it to JavaScript is, is really where I think it's interesting, and uh, we rely on, on uh, my uh, former colleagues to make that fast enough that, that that would be attractive. Uh, any other you know, engine that, that someone actually is willing to do work for, again, I hope to see the results of that. But right now it's mainly on weekend and focus on getting to JavaScript. Back again. Yeah. I've been interested in a lot of it. It's really hard to have the information about it. I wonder how much of that is built on top of the basis. What was the last bit? I wonder how much of that is So, uh, I don't know, information is, is actually fairly easy. Information is cheap, even though you know, propaganda may not be my, my expertise, but still, there, there's a fair lot of information. It is an, Squeak is an image-based system. Uh, we're not married to that idea. In particular, Newspeak has a textual representation. Right? Newspeak can go into a regular source code repository and all, and all that sort of thing. It has a syntax, not just for expressions and methods, but for, for classes and the whole thing. So uh, that would probably, Happen in a, in a way that the, the, the key issue is to get fully bootstrapped such that we can divorce ourselves completely from Squeak and then give you that option. So, contested classes as a module system is, is brilliant and in retrospect obvious. Um, and, and Beta um, introduced this idea. So, my question is really is I'm, I've really never studied Beta closely. Is it, has it been sitting there secretly for decades and we've just all ignored it, or is there some key thing that you added to make it work? Uh, I think the key thing is no global namespace. Uh, first of all, yeah, nested classes as a module is totally obvious and totally obvious to many people, and when you, and you look and see how to try to actually make it work, you, you tend to get stuck because even though it's totally obvious, it, is, it just has to be just so to actually make it work. Uh, late binding of the classes, I'm not sure how essential that is, but uh, yeah, no global namespace because because beta didn't didn't try. To so do beta almost got there, but not yeah, quite. but they did, they didn't really try. They have, there's fragments. They 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 have their own view of the world, right? And I think I have 14 seconds, so I'll take off now. Anyone talk to me later? <laughs>